because if the maxilla is in the incorrect position to the cranial base, then effectively your skeletal classification is flawed. And that's why I use a different type of classification. The classification I use is one that relates maxilla to anterior cranial base first, and then relates mandible to the maxilla. And this way you get a much better understanding of a better looking face. So let's look at class one. Now you might look at a beautiful occlusion like that and say that is class one. In actual fact, this occlusion comes from a young boy who is 10, who is a raging class three. Because it's not normal for a 10 year old boy to have a class one occlusion. Their mandible hasn't finished growing. So you can be fooled by looking at the teeth and thinking that's the classification. Just like someone who has a deep bite doesn't necessarily have a low angle skeletal. Someone who has an open bite doesn't necessarily have a long face. If I have a dual pattern like mine, low face, short face, um, deep bite, but I used to suck my thumb as a kid and now I have a six millimeter open bite dentally, do you understand that's a dental open bite but a skeletal overclosed? Most of you are used to using the Bimbler analysis, I'm, I'm correct, and I know when I question doctors on that, they have no idea what they're talking about. Who would agree with that? The good thing about Bimbler, there's lots of colors, um, which makes the patient and the parent think you know what you're doing. But I know you don't know what you're doing. Can we, can we agree on that? All right? Bimler is a very good classification. It was developed um, from a maxillofacial surgical point of view to put patients who had war injuries back into some sort of proportion. But it's confusing because it does look at dental and skeletal, but it puts them together. So somewhere in your little column, it says bite will open, and then it says bite will close. Well, what they're talking about is the dental bite versus the skeletal. I would implore you, in fact, I insist, when you talk to me, we talk the same language. And the same language is going to be Jefferson analysis. Now, Jefferson didn't really come up with this. It really is a modification of the work by Dr. Sassouni. It's an archaeal analysis. But the good thing about this analysis, it has nothing to do with um, gender. It has nothing to do with race. Um, when I trained at the Eastman, we had what's called cephalometric norms. So we had a, um, back then it was called Negroid norm. I think politically now it's called um, Afro-Caribbean norm. Um, we had what was called Chinese norm, we had Caucasian norm. And what we were doing was applying normal values to that patient set. But the problem is in the modern world, um, what happens when someone from Thailand marries someone from Ireland and they have a kid? What norm do you use for that kid? Well, that's where Jefferson is great because it, it's only based on the cranial base. Doesn't really care about the kid's background. And it's based on divine proportion. So what is skeletal one in my book? Hint, hint, one of your exam questions. Skeletal one is where the maxilla is in the correct relationship to the anterior cranial base. And then the mandible is in the correct spatial relationship to the maxilla. That's a correct skeletal one. Skeletal ones tend to have better looking faces, without a doubt. Skeletal ones tend to have less crowding, without a doubt, right? So I'm going to teach you today, in fact after the coffee break, how to do a Jefferson analysis. Even though the cephalometric module is course two, I'm going to introduce how to do a Jefferson analysis because that's the key of answering the questions of the 54 malocclusions. It's just that in course two, we do a more practical um, Jefferson in that I get you to trace and check your actual tracing. Um, but it's not rocket science. Uh, it's easy to do. On average, 
A Jefferson tracing takes about five minutes. What level of experience do you do? Um, my, when my son was nine, I taught him Jefferson and I paid him a dollar for every tracing he did. He's traced about 10,000 Jeffersons for me um, and uh, he's made a lot of money. I've saved a lot of money. So if a nine-year-old can do it, admittedly with you know, very good genes, um, uh, from half side of town, uh, um, then you can certainly do it, all right? Because the landmarks for the Jefferson analysis are easy. You don't have something like Porion, which you really are guessing. You know? um, and I'm going to go through that with you. So what's the definition of class one? In Jefferson, we don't use a point. We use the most prominent point of maxilla, ANS, anterior nasal spine. We draw an anterior arc from nasium, which then tells me where my maxilla is to the cranial base. Now, most analyses drop a vertical from nasium. Do you understand? And it's a vertical to Frankfurt horizontal, a vertical to occlusal plane, a vertical to something. The problem with dropping a vertical from nasion, you're already setting up for a flat face. Does that make sense? If you look at a good looking face, and I'm not talking about determined by an orthodontist, I'm talking about a good looking face um, as in someone who's won um, a uh, Miss Universe. I'm talking about Angela Jolie, Brad Pitt, people who make their living from having good looking face. You'll see that they all have um, a facial balance where the anterior arc is in balance, not so much the vertical. And this is the biggest problem. If you're communicating with someone who only drops a vertical, automatically they're going to think that that patient is too protrusive, too full. Right? And I want you to understand that traditional cephalometrics is fundamentally flawed um, based on the research. The most common analysis used in clinical practice today is Steiner analysis. And um, Cecil Steiner uh, was a famous orthodontist in the States. And you want to talk about evidence-based research. He woke up one morning, he looked at his son who was 12. He said, what a, looking, what a good looking boy. Very unbiased opinion. He took one ceph of his son, he traced that and that became uh, Steiner's norms. And then the rest of the world tries to um, see how close their case is to that. See how ridiculous that is? And let me tell you, I've met Cecil Steiner and his son and you know, they are not oil paintings. Yeah? Whereas when I do an archaeal analysis, it's unique for that kid regardless of his background. You understand that? Very, very important. And more and more you realise that a lot of patients who in traditional analysis are deemed too full are actually right on the money. Um, my original um, master's thesis was based um, on functional appliances and um, it was also based on facial aesthetics. Part of my research, I went to a modelling uh, studio where um, people had been selected on non uh, dental, non cephalometric criteria. And the reason I was able to do this is because I was currently treating a child of the guy who owned the studio. And this is, and I learned a lot from that, um, in modelling, there's two types of. Um, uh, models. There's face models and there's figure models. Figure models are normally anorexic looking, they eat once a month um, and they wear the couture up and down the catwalk. You understand? They may or may not have attractive faces. Face models are the ones that the makeup companies want, the ones that appear on the front of the fashion magazines, etc, uh, etc. Et you got it? Um, so this studio was a face model studio, perfect to what I wanted. 
And I said, I'll make you a deal um, because he was so impressed with the way that I did my analysis of his daughter to say, um, you know, where her jaw was in the wrong position, blah, blah, blah. He said, you know, I spend my entire life um, determining who will be a good future model for me to sign up and it's worth a lot of money. These girls are on like million dollar contracts. And he said, um, you know, could I employ you to um, determine from all the applicants that come to my modeling studio who you think would have the best facial balance? Now, hard job, but someone has to do it, yeah? Um, and I said, look, I'd love to, but I haven't got the time. I'm really, really busy. He said, I'll pay you $1,000 an hour. I said, when can I start? So the deal I did when I started doing that for him, so his criteria was, uh, if you wanted a contract with him, you had to subject yourself to a lateral CEF x-ray. And it worked perfectly because I did my Jefferson analysis and I told him, and the point I'm saying is you can quantify a good looking face. Do not think beauty is subjective. And if you wanted to have a really fair Miss World, Miss Universe contest, you'd actually have a computerized um, a result. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, anyway, the deal was I was able to give him data and I said to him, right, I'll do this on one condition. I'm doing research. Can you tell me in your current studio, and he had about 560 models on his books, and we're talking top models. Right? Uh, I said, can you tell me which 10 are your most popular? And he said, I can do that easily because I get a percentage of their booking. So he printed out the 10 names. Uh, and I said, right, would you allow me to take a CEF of their face? Um, and he said, well, it's not up to me, it's up to the girls. So I said, well, look, you know, I'll give them free whitening. And of course, deal was done. I did their CEFs, and these are all good looking girls. Yeah? And one thing we found that was very common, all of them had their maxilla right on the arc. There was no one who was maxillary deficient. Yeah. I then applied the Steiner analysis to these 10 good looking faces. All of them were protrusive. So all of them would require, in ideal orthodontic therapy, retractive orthodontics. Do you understand what I'm getting at now? The variance really in these models was based on their occlusion. Most of them were dental division two. Yeah? So there was a, a propensity to a shorter lower anterior face side as being facially attractive. <coughs> But I'm going to teach you that the best looking face is going to be someone that has skeletal class one, division one, which is a dental, and normal face height. And the way you're going to know that is not just because the maxilla and mandible will be on the right arc, but the four major cranial planes, which will be the maxillary plane, the cranial plane, the occlusal plane, the mandibular plane, those four planes meet at one point only. Okay? Um, and that is a good looking face. So, if someone was to ask me, can you define a good looking face? I would say yes, it would be a skeletal class one where the ANS point was on the anterior arc, where pagonium was on the anterior arc, where the vertical dimension was correct, and where all four facial planes come to center point out. And we're gonna show you today some of those girls from that modeling studio, just so you can see what I'm getting at. Because I want you to believe and understand this. Because if you don't understand that, and you try and apply traditional orthodontic diagnosis, Obviously, you're going to get a different result. That brings us on to skeletal class two. If I didn't use the word skeletal and I just said class two, you should understand automatically I'm talking skeletal. Now, in class two, there's three types. So automatically, we're changing from angle. You can have a class two jaw where the maxilla is normal, but the mandible is retronathic. And that's more common, isn't it? particularly in your country. Then you can have a class two where the mandible is in the right position, but the maxilla is protrusive. That's more uncommon. 